Are we recording yet, Maylin? We do are. We wanna, do we want to get going? Let's go. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. My name's Stephen Dickens, and I'm going to be your master of ceremonies for today. We've got a 65 of you with us today at current count. Hopefully that number's going to increase. Um, so we're going to cover today a really interesting project, which is Zoe. Um, I'm going to let the guys on the team over the period of the, the next hour go through and give you some more detail. Um, but Madeline, if you can maybe move us to the next chart. This is who we've got on the, on the call today. So we've got Sujay from Broadcom, we've got Alex from Vicom, and we've got Sean Grady from Rocket, um, a really stellar group of technical professionals who are really driving forward this community. So I'm going to let those guys be the star of the show here as we drive forward. But I'm just going to spend a few moments getting you orientated on what the Open Mainframe project is <clears throat> and what we're trying to do before I hand over to, as I say, the stars of our show. And I'm going to try and keep this as interactive. Um, this is not going to be hopefully um, too heavyweight. Um, and we're going to really try and keep this interactive and, and, and I'm going to keep the guys hopefully rolling and, and, and make this as, uh, as fun for you lot as possible. So what are we seeing with Linux on the platform? Um, the mainframe is really starting to get traction in the open source community. Um, we're starting to see it become a pervasive technology. We're starting to see widespread adoption. Um, and Maylin, if you start to move me forward through the next chart, uh, you'll see that we're seeing that start to reach quite significant levels of the mainframe install base. So Linux and then open source is, is really sort of a key factor for us. So if you click to the next one. But the rationale for the open mainframe project was that as we saw that rapid adoption, we didn't have a community built around the platform. We didn't have people in the, in the marketplace driving forward this technology. It was an individual challenge. There was no shared effort. The events that were going on out there, the meetups and the various activities were kind of vendor, vendor specific. They were maybe not pulling on the whole of the community. The students and academic institutions were struggling to find a way to engage. And then we were struggling to engage with the overall open source community and, and get our projects upstream. So I had the pleasure back in early 2015 of working with the Linux Foundation to found the Open Mainframe project and really look to put in place a framework to address these challenges. So Maylin, if you move me ahead. So kind of what does the Linux Foundation do? They're a home for these types of projects. When you want to get a center of gravity around a particular technology or an effort in the open source kind of community, you really should be working with the Linux Foundation. They are the, the stewards of open source in the same way that they're building a community around blockchain with the, the Hyperledger, uh, Hyperledger project. When you look at what they're doing with um, the automotive industry, um, looking to collaborate around usage of Linux in dashboards and in and um, processor units for engines. You know, all of those types of projects need a place together. How do you bring disparate parts of the community together and pro give them a home where they can collaborate? And, and that's really what the core value proposition of the Linux Foundation is. So to give you a view of the Linux Foundation's kind of focus on the Open Mainframe project, we're a collaborative project underneath their collaborative project structure. Uh, we've now got 29 organizations. We are three years since we launched back in 2015. We've got open source projects, and we're going to spend the rest of the time today talking through one of those specifically. Um, and we've been driving a really strong focus around skills and getting new professionals onto this platform. 
So what are we trying to do? What are the specifics here? So we're trying to find, give open source a place to live. We're trying to provide the infrastructure, governance, some of the legal frameworks, and then try and give the tools for this ecosystem to flourish. So hosting meetups as a core function, giving out capabilities around Slack, marshalling the efforts around GitHub, all of the sort of tools that you need for a community to flourish, that's where the focus has been. Um, and obviously, if you want to get involved in this here and you're a developer and GitHub is where you spend your time, we've got a strong open mainframe project focus on GitHub, and that's where our code and our development effort lives. So just to give some sort of view, providing that infrastructure, trying to harness the power and the crowdsource nature of open source and that developer community, also drive market awareness. So position the mainframe platform as an open source platform but also help the vendors with governance and IP. As IBM looked to donate code, as Broadcom and Rocket looked to donate code, as the vendors come into this community and also use projects, they need help and guidance and governance. And the Linux Foundation enables us to do that. And you'll see some of the projects you know, we've had interns port Alpine, which is the fundamental technology underneath Docker to the platform. And we're trying to engage these upstream projects to make sure that the mainframe is considered a first class citizen in this open source framework. So really just here, eliminating some of the barriers, trying to demonstrate value to people who are considering this platform and then strengthening the collaboration out there in the community and providing that center of gravity, if you will, so that the community can gather around this platform. That's really the mission. So, you know, I'm really proud of this next chart, the work we've been doing with these young professionals as they come to this platform. We've run an intern program since year one. Uh, we're just about to close, I think, today for the 2019 program. So hurry up if you're still considering that or you know somebody would consider that. Um, we've taken interns through the program. Um, you know, proud to see some of the fresh faces here who've then gone through this program and are now working in the mainframe community with, with employers on their first jobs. So if you like the sound of my voice and you want to hear more about what we're doing on a monthly basis, um, then we run a I'm a Mainframer podcast. Uh, a couple of the members of the group here today have been on this um, in previous episodes. It's really a way for people to tell their story. Um, I'm, I'm the host of the show, but I'm not the star of the show because it's really how I spend my time trying to get the guys who, and girls who join this um, podcast series to tell their story and really position how they're leveraging this technology to not only build their careers, but also drive forward the clients and software vendors that they're working for. So, Lots of different ways you can engage with us at the Open Mainframe Project. We've got Slack channels. We've got a discourse community. We sponsor meetups. Um, there's one of those coming in a few weeks time in down in New York that you can get involved in and multiple others. So these are the ways you can get in, engaged. Um, if personally, if you're out there and you're on Twitter and you're on some of these channels, look out for me. I'm happy to get you orientated and get you connected to the community as a whole. So how to participate. If and you want to learn more, you know, we're obviously looking for, people at a corporate level to get involved. We're looking for academics to get involved. We're looking for um, individuals to get involved. If you just want to contribute some code and you don't want to get involved in the yeah, higher level elements of the project, that's completely fine. Find us on GitHub, download some code, play with the code, contribute, and just get engaged that way. But if you want to 
go all the way to the top of this and get your corporation involved, then there's even a way for your organization to become a corporate sponsor. And here's some of the links. So I'm going to kind of pause there and start to hand over to the guys who are going to pick up the slack and get us through where we are around the exciting project that is Zoe. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, this is Sujay Solomon from, from Broadcom, as, as Stephen mentioned earlier. Uh, I'm just going to give you guys a quick overview of how Zoe started and, and some of the major components between me and Sean Grady will be covering uh, some of the major components like the command line interface and the, uh, the web desktop GUI, as well as the API mediation layer that are part of the Zoe infrastructure today. But before we get into the tech side of things, just a little bit of history. You know, uh, in 2008, uh, March of 2018, um, IBM, Rocket Software, and CA Technologies, uh, it, uh, known as Broadcom today, uh, we kind of all uh, realized that we're on a similar path, but going through it with slightly different directions. Uh, well, we all wanted to modernize the way folks were interacting with the mainframe platform, whether you're a sysprog, whether you're a developer or you're somebody who's on the operations side, we kind of wanted to really modernize the interface into all of those, uh, for, for all of those folks using the platform. And because we realized that we were on a similar path with slightly different directions, uh, we kind of got together and said, hey, why don't we use this as an opportunity to really push this into uh, the, the realm of open source and, and, and uh, we came across the OMP or Open Mainframe project and it ended up being the perfect place for us to really launch uh, the Zoe project. As you can see up there, uh, it was launched in August of 2018 at the uh, SHARE event that was held in, in St. Louis. Uh, and actually the, the, the next iteration of that is coming up in a, in a couple of weeks. So hopefully I'll see many of you there. Uh, but yeah, that was a, an event where we launched it and we got great reception there. Uh, a lot of folks joining our community. As you can see, there's 700 plus folks engaged on Slack. Uh, it's really a great place. You know, for me, even if I'm not uh, particularly building something right now, if I just had a question about just ZOS or mainframe in general, just this, this has grown into a, a network of folks who are just very open and willing to share the knowledge that they have. And, and it's really, it, it's great for folks who just want to get engaged in the platform and start learning and start actually contributing into the community. In addition to that, we actually have 50 plus active committers who are, who are constantly making changes to the code that's part of Zoe. And uh, in terms of users, we've seen over 1700 uh, beta downloads. Uh, we just recently went GA a couple of weeks ago with, with 1.0, which uh, we call production ready. But before that, we ran our, our beta program for a few months and there was a, a lot of interest there. Of course, if you want to learn more about Zoe in general, just go to zoe.org. Uh, it, it's now GA starting February 7th. And the licensing here I want to focus on is, is EPL 2.0. The reason that we settled on EPL uh, 2.0, which is Eclipse-based, uh, is that it's it's, a, it's a, a licensing model that is very conducive to, uh, to enterprise grade software, which is also open source. So you can rest assured that, you know, this is open source, but we've really taken into account the fact that uh, this will be running in, a, in enterprise uh, mainframes and we've adopted a, a licensing model that really works for that. If you could switch over to the next slide, May. So, um, in today's world, you've got development teams, you have operations teams, whether they're internal facing or they're, they're more on the IT side of things, they have to use a lot of different interfaces and tools if they want to tie mainframe into their, their uh, DevOps model or their infrastructure services model. And just, you know, on here, just a few examples, you might be interacting with TSO today or uh, the ISPF interface, or if you're more on the development side, you might be using Eclipse. Uh, and then uh, if you're doing automation on the mainframe, you might be using Rex or JCL. And sometimes you have to interact with USS as well. But going over to the next slide, just where we want to take this 
is same, you know, same underlying services on the mainframe. You have uh, jobs on the mainframe or TSO commands and all of these services like Kicks and, and DB2 and such. Uh, but what we want to do with Zoe is kind of API enable the administrative and, and development aspects of all of those services on the mainframe and allow you as a developer, as a sysprog, as an administrator or security person, be able to access those same services from interfaces that make sense and, and are modern, uh, you, whether it's a web GUI that, that Sean's gonna talk about, or if it's a command line interface that's for the purpose of uh, automation and scripting, or you know, if you want to use the APIs directly to build your own cool modern tools like what Alex is gonna show later, uh, it's all gonna be enabled through Zoe. Next slide, please. So uh, the first thing, first uh, piece we're going to focus on uh, component is the command line interface, and uh, just a little bit of background on why we're focusing on a CLI. Uh, you know, you you might realize that that a CLI is uh, inter as an interface has been around forever, right? Uh, if you were interacting with uh, a console commands even on the mainframe, that's a CLI. Uh, if you're using uh, Linux and you're issuing commands on there, or you know even today's cloud platforms like <laughs> IBM Cloud or AWS or Azure uh, or uh, modern tools like Git and, and Docker, they all have a command line interface because that allows you to automate and script in your language of choice, in your tool of choice. So going to the next slide, uh, we're kind of borrowing from that, taking a leaf off of that and, and, and building a command line interface called Zoe CLI, uh, which comes with a set of core commands that let you interact with the operating system. Uh, for example, TSO commands, console commands, data sets and jobs on the mainframe. And in addition to that, we also, uh, in Zoe, we have a, a few plugins for DB2 or for, for CICS. And of course, any other software vendor or uh, customers yourself, uh, you, can, you can also extend Zoe CLI to build your own plugins for services that you'd like to interact with from a CLI. And this now opens the doors for your DevOps engineers or your application developers uh, or anybody who really wants to do some off-platform Form scripting using languages like Python, Shell or Bash or uh, JavaScript, you name it. Uh, these, all of these scripting languages can easily consume a command line interface. And that opens the doors to using tools like Jenkins for continuous integration or uh, Mocha or Jest for test automation or uh, Gulp or Gradle for as a task runner. Uh, so that's the intent here is with the CLI, we really want uh, mainframe interaction uh, from, a, from a client perspective, the automation, uh, we don't want you to be tied to just Rex. And of course, there's nothing wrong with Rex. Uh, but I mean, today's developers and folks, we, we, we grow up on other languages like Python and such, and this opens the doors for that. So next slide, please. Uh, you know, one of the uh, common questions that I see is how do I call mainframe from Jenkins? And, and, and you know, more than the technical aspect of that, we really, we wanna call on uh, everybody here as, as a community to help answer things like this. Uh, this is the third thing that comes up uh, is, is Stack Exchange. A question was on there and I'm seeing responses on there that actually talk about calling Jenkins uh, using a command line interface or using uh, plugins and such. And we really need folks to start uh, going to some of these community platforms that are used by developers all over the world uh, to start answering some of these questions. So the, the, the awareness that there are these modern tools through Zoe available for the mainframe now. You know, the other thing is command line interfaces are also used to, can be used to build some very easy integration with uh, today's IDEs uh, or text editors. Uh, most of you are probably aware of Git. Uh, and if you go to a modern IDE, it probably has built in Git integration. Believe it or not, that's actually just usually built on top of the Git CLI that's installed onto your machine. The same way, uh, I believe we actually had a, a few interns here at, at Broadcom who built uh, a Visual Studio Code extension using Zoe CLI in a matter of uh, a few weeks, in fact. And uh, once we, uh, once they placed that on the marketplace, you can see that there's, there's more than 500 downloads already in the, in the last four or five months. And, uh, 
person from open source actually came looked at that they went to zoe's github re repo and they said hey this looks cool i can use this to interact with data sets on vs code but i also want to submit uh data uh, or submit jobs using this uh extension so they actually went ahead and made some modifications to the open source code for this extension and allowed the extension to submit jobs as well so that's kind of what we want to promote as a community as part of zoe is is you know if you if you see something you like and you start using it uh and and if you've got ideas on how to improve it please come to github please participate in the community and if you're if you've got the time and interest to actually make that change uh we would welcome that as well just just get into the code and start building things next slide please uh, so if you could start playing this, so this is just a, a very short video on uh, just the, the command line interface portion of Zoe. So you can see here, we're going to focus on the CLI uh, piece of, of Zoe here. Uh, we'll be talking about the other piece later, but uh, in a nutshell, you're, you're going to use the CLI to script things and using the scripts, you can then orchestrate uh, things like continuous integration. So here, uh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just on a terminal, uh, on a bash terminal on my machine. I issued a command to download a member from the mainframe and that downloaded successfully. I'm opening that up, uh, in this case in VS Code, making a quick change there, going into the integrated terminal there, and I'm issuing another Zoe CLI command to upload this member to the mainframe now. And there we go, it says that it was uploaded successfully. Next, after we made the JCL change, we're gonna do a, a submit of the job, again, using the command line interface. Uh, we can see that it's in input status. Now, once we've submitted it, we can check the status. And it was a quick job. It ended with a completion code of zero and it's now in output status. Uh, next, we'll list all the spool data sets that are part of that job. So there's four there and I'm interested in particular on 103, which is sysout. So let's look at the results from that. And it says we did it from Zoe CLI because this was actually a COBOL program that we ran in batch mode uh, on the mainframe. Now we're going to open up this uh, script here where all of those actions that you saw being issued manually, now uh, we just threw it into a simple shell script. We're running that shell script and it's performing those same actions very quickly where it uploaded the data set, uh, then it submitted the batch job. Uh, it's, it's waiting until it goes into output mode uh, and it, it, it ends up with a completion code of zero and all of the output from the uh, job is actually uh, displayed on your command line itself. Now, that same script, you can now take that and easily call it from Jenkins and now you've kind of got team level continuous integration and automation going. <laughs> And that's what we're, we're seeing here is which it's the same shell script uh, and we're, we're pull, putting it into, we're calling it from Jenkins. We're pushing that change into Jenkins, which is going to trigger your pipeline here. Uh, and it's using actually uh, the, the, the Zoe CLI is, is in a Docker container there that, that Jenkins is kicking off. And you can see that all of the same actions now have also been performed from Jenkins. So that was a quick introduction to the CLI. Uh, you can see that, you know, interactively, it may not be the, the best interface, but when it comes to client-side automation, scripting, integration with DevOps tools, it is the ideal interface for that. So really uh, expand it out, add more services to it. Uh, the next thing though is, uh, is we're gonna move on to talking about the web desktop, which is another angle, right? You know, uh, CLI is great for scripting and automation, but when it comes to a user interacting with uh, a graphical interface, uh, we have a web desktop uh, in Zoe that, that Sean will talk about. Thanks, CJ. So, hello everyone, this is uh, Sean Grady. And um, with Zoe, we were looking at the how people use the mainframe today, how they interact with it. And we saw that there were many different approaches to making a uh, modern and intuitive interface for interacting with the mainframe. Uh, you know, ultimately the last time in which there was really a standard interface was 3270 and ISPF. And so since then people have gone in different directions. One thing that people have done is make, uh, you know, programs that you would install on a Windows computer that would communicate with the mainframe in some way. And um, that provides you with a very nice UI, but has certain problems with, well, 
you have to install this on multiple computers or it might only work on certain operating systems and you know maybe there's more prereqs to consider um, so we saw that um, more recently people have been making websites to interact with the mainframe and this uh, you know has different pros and cons with websites you have a near or truly zero install um, however websites tend to be compartmentalized you know you have one website that's for db2 and another for ims and so we were thinking with zoe you know how do we really get everyone on the same page with interacting on the mainframe so that it's intuitive it's efficient and that the next generation can be onboarded onto the platform without really having to learn anything that's specialized when a lot of the interactions <laughs> that you do on a computer are universally applicable you know whether whether you are on one operating system or, the, or another you're still executing programs and dealing with data and so we want to really make that experience uniform so um so we're looking at this challenge and if we go to the next slide uh we can look oh, sure. at the solution that we came up with so what we wanted to do was have a zero install so that people can use this on any system that they have and give them the kind of tooling that they have come to expect on a user interface from a desktop application <clears throat> and to really have everything in one place so that the programs that they have can interact to help give insights and help do a workflow very quickly so what we built is uh, a single page application, um, but the, the twist that we have here is that this single page application allows you to have multiple apps running simultaneously. So with the Zoe app framework, what we're doing here is now it's possible to have multiple apps written by different parties using different web technologies to coexist within the same web page. And this is really powerful for us because this way you can, you know, interact with DB2 and IMS and other aspects of the mainframe all in one place, all without installing anything on the client machine. And it really runs on pretty much every operating system that a client would use, including things like Chromebooks. So this is all powered by modern web technologies. Um, JavaScript, uh, uh, ECMAScript 6, HTML5, CSS. Um, the performance of it, uh, uh, apps are loaded just in time, just as if they are on a desktop operating system, such that if you have uh, you know, 50 apps, it's not going to make the page uh, slower to load. Apps are just loaded when they're needed. And so memory consumption is also kept in check. We have um, deduplication of common libraries. So if everyone is using a bootstrap for their web development, it's only loaded once instead of many times. Uh, so let's go to the next page. And uh, here's just a picture of the login screen of Zoe. And you can see that, uh, as I said here, this is a single page web application. Um, and uh, it's just running in Google Chrome in this image. And this login screen the credentials in which you put in here are going to be checked against staff. So we are not adding any new security model to the mainframe. We are just using what is there. So every, every bit of security still applies. So next slide, please. Um, on this web desktop, you know, one of the things that we do for the demo is a full screen, the browser, and that way it looks like a real desktop rather than in a page, but, um, but it really does just act like a desktop. One of, the, um, one of the reasons why we did this, we had a uh, motto, all of the old and all of the new. We, uh, we respect that on mainframe, people may have become accustomed to doing something a certain way very efficiently. And so in making a new interface, we didn't want to take anything away from what people currently do. We just wanted to give them options to do everything in one place and to have avenues for new programs that can help them in new ways. So the first thing that you'll see inside of the Zoe desktop is that we have a 3270 terminal 
Again, it's a zero install thing that works in the browser. So if you have any existing workflows in a terminal, you're not left out here, it is there. But additionally, you'll see some new apps. Um, the explorers will help you to interact with files and data sets and jazz. We are working on an editor. And uh, really, if you have any website that pre-exists, that website can be hosted in this same page. So the catalog of, of DOE software that you can do in the UI, it really starts off including everything that's already on the internet and then building upon the services that, um, that the Zoe project itself is giving to the community and uh, allowing you to um, program in your favorite languages. So let's go to the next slide and uh, see an example of some of these apps. So here's the terminal looking at uh, Proclib and we can see the same thing in the MVS Explorer. So really this is just giving us choice to look at something in the way that feels most natural to us. So you might have one person who wants the UI and another person who wants the terminal and um, both of these people will be happy in this environment. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, here is uh, <coughs> another view um, looking at different jobs that are being executed. And so you can see here that um, one of the things that you can do in this environment is you can start from one app, gain insights from it, and move to another app. Uh, one of the things that exists in this structure is an app to app communication channel. So if you found out some insights from a Jazz Explorer, you might be able to jump from the Jazz Explorer in context to the terminal or an editor or something that would be able to logically help you do your day to day tasks. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so as I was saying earlier, the, the goal here is really to have everything in one place when it comes to UI. And so um, this is going to be using something that we'll talk about shortly, the API mediation layer, another component of Zoe that just helps to represent everything as coming from one place. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so if you are interested in um, taking your uh, products and adding them to this Zoe environment, there's multiple avenues that you can take. Number one here is if you have a pre-existing site, you can connect it to the mediation layer, which we'll talk about shortly. And uh, that just allows it to be hosted within the same domain. And once it's in the same domain, uh, we have different wrappers for being able to include apps in the Zoe UI. And one of these wrappers is an iframe wrapper, which allows pre-existing websites to be contained inside of a window here. So what we see on the screen is um, a website it's called Jupyter. It's a, a free data science notebook for Python programmers. And um, this Jupyter server in this image was uh, running on the OS and simply uh, we were able to put in inside of that Zoe desktop by just having this window that says point to this Jupyter server. This way people can uh, collaborate by utilizing the Zoe apps that they already have and comparing them to these websites that uh, pre-existed Zoe. Um, next slide. Um, so here, here's the other thing uh, that you can do in the UI if you're making programs is if you want to make a program from scratch in the web, um, there, are, there are new popular and upcoming web frameworks such as Angular, React, and Vue. And uh, people can get into spirited discussions about which one is best when they're making a new program. And normally you have to decide on one but in Zoe, we've come up with a way in which that's not the case. You can actually program in your favorite um, web framework and, and have it coexist with other apps in Zoe that were written in a different framework. So 
we are able to have this sort of encapsulation of different frameworks within this within the same web page. Um, we we do this um, through use of Webpack. Um, if people are interested, we can always talk on Slack. But really, the idea is if you're making a new program, you're able to continue writing in the framework that you're familiar with, um, with very minor differences. And you're also getting a lot for free here because now that you're in this multi-app environment, you can start to make use of things like our notification API or app to app communication. And we've just included all of these APIs into the framework so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel and you can get a lot of value without a lot of effort. So that's all in the Zoe UI. Um, now for the next slide, I think we're onto the mediation layer. So thank you. Thanks, Sean. Uh, and you know, this is the next topic here is you, you, we saw two clients here and, and keep clicking through me. Uh, we saw a couple of clients, right? We saw a command line interface using APIs on the mainframe to help you automate things. Then we saw another client in uh, the, the GUI and multiple applications within the GUI using APIs on the mainframe to again, let you perform actions and look at data on the mainframe. Now, in today's world, uh, without Zoe in the picture, you've got this sort of, uh, of, of a client server architecture where all of the clients are very tightly tied to their own server that's running on the mainframe. And that really is not ideal because you're, you, you're not gonna have a uh, single sign-on. So everybody has to log on to each server individually. Uh, in terms of security, the certificates are, are, are very much separated out. So to s resolve all of this, uh, go ahead and make the next slide. We've introduced an API gateway into the uh, Zoe infrastructure, which will kind of sit in the middle and, and al allow all of these clients that are out there, uh, uh, the, the GUIs, the CLIs, automation that you might be building, your own tools, like what Alex is gonna show, uh, they can all go through the, the API gateway to get uh, data from all of these uh, APIs and servers that are running on the mainframe. And it comes with a lot of advantages. Uh, this might provide us single sign-on, uh, it, it provides us a, a consolidated API catalog where we have all of the Swagger doc on there and so on and so forth. So this is, you know, this may not be the most interesting thing, but infrastructure wise, it really gets everything together uh, from an architectural perspective. And next slide, please. Here's a quick screenshot here where we have uh, the API catalog for Zoe on there. Uh, we can see that there are uh, a bunch of services that are already up and running, data sets and, and job services from a Zoe API perspective. We also have integration with the ZOSMF service as well and it's, it's showing you here that it's up and running as well. And then uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of development going on from a commercial aspect with this. Uh, you can see IBM has a new IDE called WASI that's powered by Zoe. Uh, CA or Broadcom, uh, we, we have a product called Brightside, which is based on Zoe. Uh, there's quite a few rocket products. Uh, one of them is Blue Zone Web that's, that's based on Zoe. So it's not just the open source. Uh, big companies are starting to actually leverage this for their commercial products and it's just gonna keep on growing, so. Now I'll, I'll move this on. I, I'll forward it to, to Alex, who's going to talk about uh, some of the innovations that, uh, that uh, has been built on top of Zoe. Thank you, Jay and Stephen and Sean. Um, my name is Alex Kim from my Vicom Infinity. Uh, we are the IBM's uh, premier business partner for mainframe. So we were trying to show, um, you know, a lot of, technologies on, on mainframe, how we can utilize it and help customers to use it. And recently we had a chance to work on a fun project, the voice interface for the mainframe, how you can talk to the mainframe. We have a lot of, you know, out there, Alexa Echo and Google Home and Shuri on a, your smartphones that people use it every day. Uh, in my case, my son, you know, is eight, eight months old and he knows that uh, if I say Alexa that he knows that the baby shark song will come out so he's so dancing and start laughing around um, 
Some people use it every day, but not many people use uh, at all because they are afraid their voice and conversation will be stored in the cloud somewhere and someone might take advantage of it. So we were thinking about how we can make it safer and secure if they come to the enterprise space and we try to um, combine the system Z and Linux One secure container services and Watson assistance, the on-prem version of it uh, with Ivan Cloud private. And we built uh, something called uh, Viva over here that lets you try that, you know, it's a, it's a prototype and a MVP, but it actually can show you how we can securely talk to the mainframe and data center operations. Um, we use the, uh, before Zoe, we were using a bunch of different APIs from ZOS and BCPII as well to demonstrate functions and uh, answer the questions. But with Zoe API catalog and mediation layer and gateway, we don't need to rely on third party um, or outside of Z, um, ZOS API gateway like API Connect. Uh, so long story short, let me, you can see the screen that we have a couple of, you know, sample commands that we try to demonstrate here. And uh, I'll show you a quick demo over here. If you, if you see my video, you will see probably a little device over here. Uh, it's a prototype again. It's a 3D printed, so a little quirky, but uh, uh, we call it TJ. And um, hey, TJ, what is the current CPU utilization? The currency system's CPU utilization is 1%. Our, our system is very low utilized. Uh, nothing running other than Zoe. <laughs> so um, we have a couple of other, you know, commands that we can try. Hey, TJ, what is the current IFL utilization? The current total physical IFL utilization is 22.6%. And we are thinking about a case where in the enterprise, uh, there is a busy trading day, uh, your managers running, you know, busy and your system operators, system programmers, all heads down trying to solve the problems. If there's any bottlenecks and, and your manager wants to know how the mainframe is doing or batch stuff is doing. And we want to kind of help them understand it. If they're not, you know, hands-on people that how the mainframe is working today. Hey, TJ. Hey, TJ. Hey, TJ. How long my batch job run today? I only have information about the SysDL PARS key batch jobs. They finished at 3.30 a.m. And, and sometimes you want to know about, you know, how your software license look like for this month compared to last month. Hey, TJ. How is the outlook for my mainframe software bill for this month? The current forecast for peak four hour average is showing 3% less than last month. All right, I'm gonna mute for a second. Uh, there are many use cases that you can think of, you know, the sky's the limit, not only from data center operation perspective, but any regions application, your DB2, CSS, MQ, uh, you, can, you can create a lot of things and then you can create a uh, application and also API calls through Zoe. Um, I just wanted to show you something quick. Uh, I'd like to thank especially uh, some Zoe developers in UK, you know, Colin Stone and, and uh, Joe Winchester. They created this uh, API called CPU Uses It Snapshot. Uh, you can go to Zoe uh, website and you can find more about it. In the, it's in the GitHub uh, and you can actually uh, test it out yourself and you can if I want to I don't know if I can share my screen um, Let me see Thank you Right here So so this is the, the API catalog That 
you can see the CPU using the snapshot uh, API that we added, uh, created by Colin Stone from uh, UK, IBM UK. And this is the one of the uh, get API requests. You can see a current CPU utilization is 1%. So it, it was very easy and simple um, uh, to import and adopt to our, you know, the Viva application. And there are many other APIs that you can use. You can go over here in the GitHub and you can try yourself. So I wanted to go back, hand back to, um, uh, to May and Steven. Uh, if you have any questions, you know, send me an email and be happy to help. It was great working with the Zoe team because they are so helpful. Every time I have a question on the Slack channel, everybody try to help me out. So thank you again, Zoe team. Thanks, Alex. And, and that voice activated um, interface to the mainframe, super cool. We got to find a way to get that uh, um, out to a wider audience. May Lin and I were pinging in the background. We need to kind of get you to run that demo just solely so that we can show the community the innovation that Vicom's driving. Sure, so, sure, anytime. Thank you. So really want to just sort of pause here. We've got a huge community. We've got, I think, 93 people on the line. Um, we've seen quite a few questions already pop up in the chat and thanks to everybody who's dived in to try and answer some of those, but really wanted to throw the line open now to anybody who's got a question, whether it's super technical, whether it's about how do I get engaged? How does this type of project work? We've got all the right people on the line here to get you orientated. So I'll kind of pause there and, and, and open up the line to questions. Don't be shy. Hi, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, go ahead. <clears throat> um, I mean, if we have to test anything like uh, just on the cloud or something, you know, can we do that uh, with IBM without actually installing it? Uh, we I mean, don't... Can, can we do hands-on on this, on this software or on Zoe? I mean, Sujay, do you want to take that one about how c customers are kind of interacting with this? and kind of running it in their shops and doing the testing. Sure, um, you know, uh, a lot of folks are kind of taking a phased approach there. The key to enabling a lot of the client side advantages is, is setting up the APIs uh, as the first thing on the mainframe. And a lot of what you saw today, what Alex showed, what what uh, I showed, and what, what Sean showed with, with the GUI and the CLI, it's, it's driven by uh, some of the ZOSMF APIs that are available, as well as uh, some Zoe uh, layering, Zoe's own APIs that are uh, operating on top of ZOSMF as well. So setting up those APIs on the mainframe and getting the security watertight uh, on there is probably the most important first step to take. After that, uh, being able to use a CLI, being able to use the web GUI, or uh, any of the uh, integrating it into any of your own homegrown applications, it's it's a it's a second, probably much easier step there. Sujay, do you want to expand a little bit and maybe say how people are running this in kind of test environments in their own shop? I mean, what's the kind of best practice there? Sure, um, I'd say uh, a lot of folks have just been interested in exploring the possibilities with Zoe, uh, and, and they usually take the approach of, of getting the APIs and the, and the web GUIs backend, uh, which includes the ZSS server, uh, all of those running in perhaps just a, a sandbox environment in their, in their test help bar or such. Uh, they, they get that going there. Uh, they start actually using uh, the, the CLI and the web GUI, uh, and, and beyond that, uh, you're now able to start branching out and once you've gained confidence in that and especially with 1.0 which is which is GA uh, the, which was GA last month uh, we now claim that it's, it's, it's a production grade software and you're, you're you're now able to start moving that into your different stages right? you go from test uh, next in the QA and then possibly into production as well so that you've got full coverage there Fantastic. <laughs> Have we got any other questions? Some great answers there from Sujay. Yeah. Have we got any other questions from yeah. the, the group? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. 
So uh, does the Python plugin for uh, Zoe has the ability to issue MVS commands like Rex? Uh, so, some, so just before you, somebody's typing um, with very heavy fingers. So if you can go on mute, whoever's typing, that'd be great. That's better. Thank you. Um, so what, what I was, when I was showing the command line interface and I was saying that you can call it from, from Python or any scripting language, that was, that was client side Python. So you don't necessarily have to run Python or any of the other uh, scripts on ZOS itself since the command line interface lets you call it from any client that you might have. Uh, does that clarify that? Um, so, um is there any document for like uh, the syntax or anything that we can oh, use? Oh, absolutely. So, so the, CLI, the CLI is self-documented. So if you download it onto your PC and you issue uh, Zoe help, it'll bring up uh, a set <coughs> of commands. And your particular question of being able to run Rex scripts uh, using the, the command line interface, I believe you can invoke Rex scripts using TSO commands. And Zoe CLI lets you execute TSO commands as, as part of its set of core commands. And I've had lots of folks do that. So they'll say Zoe TSO issue command, and then you'll just do an exec for the, the Rex exec that you have on a, on a member uh, or a data set on the mainframe. And that should let you execute Rex from any client side script. So you and, mean that uh, you just have to download the CLI, that's it? I mean, there is no software in the background that needs sure. to be- Sure. So on, on, the, on the mainframe side, uh, what is powering those commands? Uh, and actually the rest of what you saw here is, uh, is APIs on the mainframe. Uh, and in particular for executing Rex scripts using the TSO functionality, uh, you will need uh, a facility called ZOS, ZOSMF or ZOS Management Facility. Uh, th it comes with a set of REST APIs and it's part of the ZOS operating system. And, and a lot of Zoe's uh, capabilities rely on ZOSMF being there. Okay, so when we are talking about uh, the Python plugin, uh, is it going to be the IBM's version or the Rockets version that is being supported by Zoe right now? So I, I'm, I, I don't think we have a Python plugin in Zoe. And I, I see Sean posting uh, in chat that I think you might be talking about uh, something else that's, that's in- yeah, the, uh, the Rockets forum uh, has the Python uh, version for ZOS 2.7 and 3.6, but uh, it doesn't uh, support uh, issuing the MVS commands. It just let uh, runs the jobs or like transferring the file, sending it FTPing from ZOS to Unix, like that. Mm -hmm. so yeah, that might be, so that might be that something might be that you thing. post on the right. forum. Uh, wish list. Hey guys, we got a couple of people talking. Can, I don't know which one of you is going to answer, but we just got a couple of people. And whoever's still typing, it's really, if, you, if I could ask you to go on mute. Or slim down your fingers, whichever one's quicker. <laughs> so, hey guys, we had a couple of people talking. Does one of you want to take a spin at that uh, that answer? Yeah. So, uh, when it comes to other open source projects, you know, we would we would love to expand Zoe by helping it to make ZOS, you know, as as good as can be. Um, however, when it comes to things like Python and Node.js and uh, Git, these are all still, um, while they are open source projects, they're outside of the Zoe sphere. Um, so I think those sorts of questions we need to forward on to the respective forums for those groups. Yeah, and that's a mission of the open mainframe project to, uh, as a whole. So Zoe's a sub project within the open mainframe project. The mission of the Open Mainframe Project as a whole is to find, is to find a way to inter intersect with those other upstream communities for other projects. So, you know, through our shared parentage in the Linux Foundation, we've got some of those great roots into those projects. So if a project needs help from another open source project, we, we've got some really good channels in order to do that. 
both at a technical level and at a commercial level and at an ownership level. So guys, yeah, we're coming close. Specific. Go ahead. Sorry, I cut across you. No, sorry, Stephen. You're about to do a wrap. So the person asking the question about issuing MBS com console commands. So we do issue a number of console commands during Zoe's install process. And we actually have a shell script called oppercommands.sh and that can be run. So you could, from Python, if you wanted to, you could use that shell script to issue an MVS command. Reach out on Slack if you want some more help. Um, it's, an, it's not a use case that we built it for, but it would work for you. Thanks. You're welcome. So guys, we're coming to the end here. We've had as many as 93 people on this call, which is fantastic. Um, there's, as you can see, there's a vibrant community. We've had a couple of different vendors. We've had one of our business partners. I think we've got a disparate community starting to build around this code base. I'd recommend anybody gets involved, you know, download the code, get involved on GitHub, ask questions download Slack, get engaged. We've got a really vibrant um, community starting to develop around this effort. So just get involved. It, it, this is going to be a community effort as we drive forward. This code base is going to evolve. It was contributed by three vendors, but already we're starting to see it move up beyond that and starting to see a community form around this set of code. So, I'd encourage anybody to download the code and get stuck in. Uh, we've got some key people here that you can reach out to on Slack, but just from what I've seen of that community, that when anybody asks a question, there's answers that are coming quickly. So please engage with us. Um, based on the evidence of this and 93 people attending, we won't be, do, we'll be certainly doing this again in the coming months. Um, so we'll obviously try and publish that out and look to get you involved and, look to make sure that you can attend those future calls. And, and with that, Maylin, I'll, I'll look to wrap the call and give everybody back at the top of the hour. So are, are you going to share the video? Are you going to share this slide? Oh, yeah. So everything we share today, we'll put out on Slack. Uh, we'll try and find a put it, way to put it on either zoe.org or openmainframeproject.org. Thank you. So, Maylin, I'll... I'll wrap proceedings there and if you want to just close out the call that'll be fantastic wonderful thank you everyone